Welcome back once again to the Pursuit Zone podcast. I'm Paul Schmidt, and I interview explorers that dream big, break out of their comfort zones, and take on ambitious pursuits. This is episode 209 with Simon Parker. In this episode, we talk about the development of his career in journalism, his experience sailing across the Pacific Ocean, and his experience cycling across the U.S. Let's start the show, and let me introduce Simon. He lives a life of adventure as a travel writer and broadcast journalist, reporting from over 100 countries in the past decade. Back in 2016, he sailed and cycled from China to London in 133 days. The main legs of this journey were a 28-day yacht race across the North Pacific, then cycling across the USA in 49 days, before getting back into the race on a different crew and sailing 11 days across the North Atlantic, from New York to Derry, Londonderry, in Northern Ireland. His latest creation is a video series titled Earth Cycle. In the first season, he cycles 2,000 miles in Norway and Sweden, interviewing locals and shining a light on environmental issues. You can learn more about Simon at simonwparker.co.uk. Simon Parker, welcome to The Pursuit Zone. Thank you very much, Paul. Lovely to uh, speak to you. It's always nice to connect with like-minded, adventurous people. So I- I'm looking forward to going back over some of my adventures with you over the course of the next hour. Simon, I'm curious about where you grew up. So I grew up in a very, very small village in southern England in Oxfordshire. So I grew up in a what we would in Britain call a hamlet. So there was probably only 10 houses in this tiny little village. And I grew up surrounded by fields on every side with cows and sheep and tractors and four by fours. And it was quite a bucolic upbringing, I guess. But if if it taught me anything, I realized that I found it quite boring. (laughs) I didn't really have much to do other than walk over the fields and go for little adventures on my own. And um, when I finally reached the age of 18, I was just absolutely chomping at the bit to get out there and explore the world. So I grew up in southern England, um, but since then I've been traveling a huge amount. When you turned 18 or so, did you go off to university? So at the age of 18, like most teenagers growing up in Britain, I didn't really know what on earth I was going to do with my life. And I, um, I did go off to university but I only lasted one year because I absolutely hated every minute of it. I was so restless and eager for adventure that I did one year at university. And then I managed to convince the university to let me take, um, let me take a year off, I guess a, a sabbatical, or I think they called it an interruption of my studies. So I went off and I spent 18 months hitchhiking from the very northernmost point of New Zealand all the way down to the southernmost point of New Zealand. And then I went and hitchhiked from one side of Australia all the way to the other. And after 18 months, I returned to Britain just with this newfound feeling of purpose, I guess. And I went back and I I knew that I really had to go back to my studies because I really wanted to make travel a professional element of my life. So I did go back to university and then I got a good degree and then it spiraled from there, really. It became a snowball, which has then allowed me to travel around the world as a a professional journalist. Did you study journalism? No, I didn't. I studied English and cinema, actually. I often get asked by people about studying journalism and I personally learned everything about being a journalist on location, being in the studio, being in the newsroom. And if there are young people listening to this who are thinking about what they may one day do, my advice would probably be to do a degree, but do a degree in something a little bit more broad. I think most skills that you can learn about being a journalist can be learnt on the job. I think it's much better to get a foundation in history or politics or economics before then you can branch out and learn to be um, learn to be a journalist on location. 
I'm surprised that after those adventures in New Zealand and Australia, at the age you were, that you were able to go back and focus on studies at all. I would have thought you would have just said, this is so much fun. I want to keep going and doing the doing the adventure part. Yeah, I guess you would think that. And that did cross my mind. But I really wanted to strive to make a career out of something and be respected in a professional capacity. No disrespect to those people who've chosen a life of adventure and go off backpacking at the age of 19 and never come home. But I didn't really want to just backpack around the world and work in bars or volunteer on farms or goodness knows what. I did that for a couple of years. But what I really enjoy about what I do now is I get to live that life. I get to pretend to be a backpacker. But then at the same time, I also have some form of journalistic and professional credibility, I hope. So it's a, it's a marriage between the two things. I get to go off and behave like a, a teenager and go off and climb mountains and sail across oceans and do stuff like that. But then at the same time, I've turned that passion into something which earns me at least some money to survive. Whereas if I would have gone the other option, I would have had to work in a bar or do perhaps lesser skilled jobs, which would have then provided me with enough money to go off and have these adventures. So I, I chose to go back to university and, and just put myself through it for two more years. And I ended up getting a very good degree just because I knew exactly what I wanted in life. So while you were going to school and preparing yourself for your initial start into journalism, what were your influences were you, I mean, was there stuff on the BBC that you were influenced by? Um, what, what were you consuming that, that you said, you know, one day I want to make things like this? So I would guess I was always very much obsessed with watching travel documentaries on TV and flicking through old copies of National Geographic magazine. When I was growing up, my parents worked extremely hard and we never really had a huge amount of money to go off and have big adventures or anything more than maybe a, a week in Spain or a week in Cornwall or something like that. So I'd, I'd never been off or done anything big like that. I was never in the scouts or anything like that growing up. But I was a very, very restless young man who was just desperate to go out there and just, I think, be on his own in the middle of nowhere. When I was growing up as a teenager, I really struggled with authority. I really struggled with being told what to do by my teachers. And that used to get me in a huge amount of trouble at school. And I guess I'm still a little bit like that now as an adult. I don't really like being told how I should be living my life. And the best thing about being on the other side of the world in the middle of nowhere is that you're not really harming many people. You can be in a mountain range or goodness knows where, and, and you're your own boss. So I was always very much addicted to that sort of lifestyle, if I'm honest. What was your first job out of university? So out of university, I, like most people, had no idea what on earth I was really going to do with my life professionally. At that point, I hadn't really decided that I wanted to be a journalist. But what I did have was this first class degree, which I think looking back, probably put my CV somewhere towards the, the top of the pile, which was beneficial to me. So I, I sent my CV out to a load of organizations around the world, and I sent it out to the United Nations. I sent it out to some non-government organizations, and I sent it to the BBC. Now, the first job I got was working for an NGO based in Brussels. And this was a six month internship working for the International Diabetes Federation. And I went out to Brussels and I took this internship. And if I'm totally honest, I wasn't very good at it at all. I, I, I really didn't like sitting behind a desk. I didn't really enjoy doing communications. I didn't like the idea of doing something like that stuck in an office. I just felt so restless again. So I did my six months there, but if I'm honest, I probably didn't get out of it what I should have really strived to. And I was just desperate to, to move into a slightly different field. So I went home and I, um, I applied for an internship placement at my local BBC radio station. 
And thankfully, they took me on and they gave me a, a six month placement working for BBC Sport. And this first job in journalism basically involved me going around to local soccer matches and reporting on really, really low level soccer matches. And I used to call into the studio on a Saturday afternoon with my mobile phone. And I used to get about 30 or 40 seconds on the radio to report on matches that were happening around Oxfordshire. And this was my first opportunity to get my voice on the radio. So the first couple of years of my career were actually spent, were actually spent uh, working in sports journalism. And I still do a little bit of sports journalism today, actually. Only last year, I, um, I got an exclusive for the BBC with Roger Federer in South Africa, which was a, a career highlight. I love my sport. And similar to this podcast, I guess, I'm, I'm really fascinated with people who have pushed their bodies to the limit. I'm, I'm interested in how human beings can really push themselves and strive to be a, an incredible version of themselves. I watched your TEDx talk, uh, which is really good. I'll put a link in the show notes for that so people can go see it. But you had mentioned that you were working in like the newsroom, I'll call it, and all these these people that were out in the field were sending in their reports and you were getting like, oh, I got to go out there and do that. Like what job was that that you were in during that time? That was when I'd progressed into the newsrooms of central London. So once I moved out of local journalism, I got my first break. Uh, on the national news channels and I relocated to London and I started working for a news network called ITN and at ITN I remember I would do shifts on the the news desk there and basically what that job would involve was liaising with journalists around the world who were sending in their material so we used to have these computers and these servers and a journalist would send in, um, I don't know, a reel of tape doing an interview in South Africa or Australia or goodness knows where. And then back at base, we would then edit that together to make a package which would go out online or on the news or television or goodness knows where. And after a while, I just thought to myself, you know, why am I working myself into the ground in the newsroom to save up enough money to go away traveling? when what I could ultimately do is try and make a shift towards travel writing, foreign correspondency with these skills that I've developed in the newsroom and actually then turn that desire to travel and that desire to see interesting parts of the world into something which makes me money. So I remember I managed to get a contact of an editor working on the travel desk at uh, the Daily Telegraph I sent him an email out of the blue and I sent him a couple of ideas. And once again, like anything in life and the way opportunities develop, he liked the story that I sent to him and he actually published it a couple of weeks later. So then I had my first byline in a national newspaper talking about a trek I'd done in Peru a couple of years beforehand. And I guess the rest is history after that. That was about eight years ago. And then since then, I nowadays I write, oh, goodness me, maybe 100 stories a year for The Telegraph. And I do stuff for the BBC and TV broadcasters and radio stations. And honestly, it, it feels like my, my dream job. It doesn't really feel like a job. I just absolutely love it so much. Congratulations. You're, you're one of the few, I think, that's, that's figured out how to uh, live that dream life. Yeah, it's, um, it does feel like an immense privilege. It hasn't happened by chance in any way. I, I've made thousands of calculated steps to get to this point. And actually, it becomes a massive obsession because you have to be good to be able to get the work. And it really is a, a meritocracy the newspapers, the BBC will only employ people who are consistently producing good stuff. And I don't mean to say that in terms of trying to massage my ego, but it actually, it really makes you realize that you have to hone your craft and you have to, you have to realize what's good and bad journalism, what works, what doesn't. And I actually really like that. I like working hard. If anything, you know, my mum and dad, 
they had a catering business when they grew up and I didn't know anyone in journalism and I wasn't brought up in any way surrounded by journalism. But if there's anything I have to thank them for, it's this industrious spirit, I guess. I really do enjoy hard work. I like grafting and then seeing what comes out the other side. And I think I'll always be addicted to that if I'm totally honest. I'm curious, when you are working these jobs, as like you just mentioned, for these publications, are you working as a freelancer? Yep. So I have always been freelance officially, although I've worked consistently for the BBC for 10 years, Telegraph for seven or eight officially i'm freelance but you just develop a relationship with the organization and you just go from there really but i quite like it although sometimes you start to freak out a little bit that all of a sudden your your work might end overnight it actually gives you a lot of freedom so for example if i pitch loads and loads of stories in one week i might have six or seven things to write But then if I want to take a couple of weeks off and either go on holiday or just, I don't know, just chill out for a bit, I'm not tied to doing anything. So I can just work, providing my editors decide that they still want to work with me, I can work as much or as little as I like. And I know that freaks a lot of people out, you know, people who have a salary and they're used to the money dropping into their their bank accounts every, every month. But this is all I've ever known. And actually, the the thing I really like about being self-employed and freelancing for two or three different organizations means that I can only really work on what I want to work on. I only pitch things that I'm genuinely interested in. And whereas when at the beginning of my career, when I was working in the newsrooms, I used to turn up in the morning and I would get put on a story which I didn't pick i didn't choose it but i was told right we need someone to turn this story around for the six o'clock news or for uh, an online something or other and by the end of it i just absolutely loathed working on stories that i wasn't interested in but at least what i do now when i pitch an idea to my editor it's something which i'm actually genuinely interested in you know when i say that it doesn't really feel like a job because I would probably be online or reading books about these subjects anyway. I find these things fascinating in their own right. But the cool thing is, as a columnist or as a travel writer or a journalist, is that I get to read all these things, assimilate this information, and then turn it into something which I can make money off. So that's why it does feel like an immense privilege. Well, what I'd like to do is I'd like to get into talking about this adventure that you did, the sailing, the cycling, and then back on the boat again. And I also listened to your audio documentary that you made about it. I really liked it. And if there's time, maybe we can talk about talk about uh, the craft of kind of creating that as a freelancer. Sure. And so I guess, first of all, so you're in China, you're about to step on a, on a, get into a yacht race to go on this first leg. I mean, how did this whole thing come about? Again, sort of working as a, a travel writer, I'm always trying to come up with ideas. And I found out that the round the world yacht race was setting off from london and they were heading off on a fifty thousand mile circumnavigation of the planet 12 identical yachts in this 12 month journey around the planet so i pitched to my editor at the telegraph and said have we ever had anything on this do we know much about this crazy race around the world i was thinking of perhaps joining one of their training weeks and seeing what it's like and seeing if I could put be put through my paces. So I wrote a story about training for the Round the World Yacht Race. And then conversations started to develop between myself and the organizers about potentially joining a leg. So they said that I could pick a leg if I wanted to, if I could get a, um, a commission from the Telegraph. So I pitched it to my editor and he said, yeah, if you're prepared to do it, go and do it. And then just because probably I'm a complete and utter sadist and a glutton for punishment, I thought to myself, well, if I'm going to do it, I should pick the hardest leg and the longest leg. So I decided to then um, sail in the North Pacific 
leg from China all the way to Seattle. And if I'm totally honest, it turned out being the worst month of my entire life. I threw up constantly for a month with just incapacitating seasickness. It was just utterly horrible. I knew it was only going to be momentary, although it felt like the end of the world at the time. I knew that when I got off that yacht, I could say, not even to many people, but just to myself, you have sailed across the Pacific Ocean and you've seen and heard what it was like. And I'm really thrilled by experiences like that. I don't want to live my life vicariously through other people. I want to go out and see and feel what the world is like close up. Yeah, it was just an utterly horrendous experience, if I'm totally honest. So this is the Clipper Round the World Yacht Race. Uh, I had never heard of it before. So it's essentially like one professional skipper, and then everyone else on board is, would you call them an amateur, or are you just, just a regular person off the street? You end up with a mixture of very serious amateur sailors, and then groups of people who like the idea of doing something incredibly challenging. Of course, they don't just let people turn up, pay a few thousand pounds and then just head out across an ocean. You have to do at least one month of compulsory extreme training to make sure that you're equipped with all the skills to get across an ocean because it's really, really hardcore. The swirling open ocean is just the most disgusting and ghastly place. Human beings just aren't meant to go out into the open ocean. We weren't designed for that place. And it's just it's a place that just wants to eat you up and kill you at any possible opportunity. So um, it's a mixture. Yeah. One professional skipper and then probably half the team are very, very serious amateur sailors who just love the idea of sailing around the world. And then you have other sailors who get involved, who just want to do something epic and can afford to do it because it's not cheap. I think a circumnavigation costs about £50,000 to do the whole thing. If I'm totally honest, I, I, was, I was just totally out of my depth. I wasn't cut out for that environment. I'm glad I did it, but I would never go out into the open ocean again. So what did that 30 days of training look like? That was broken up into four one-week training sessions, I guess. And that was everything from learning how to clean a, um, a yacht to real proper sailing experience. So heading out around Britain, sailing downwind, upwind, all of the dozens of different knots that you have to do and learn. Also, just experiencing what life is like at 45 degrees, because when a yacht is sailing at full pelt, it starts to turn over on its side, almost like a snowboard riding on its edge. That takes a lot of getting used to. Your whole world gets moved to one side and everything's being thrown up and down and you're being twisted up and down. It is a, a very, very strange experience. So you have to get used to all of that. And then, of course, you have to get used to the potential rescue drills and the, the safety drills associated with if anything goes wrong. So we would do things like man overboard safety drills. We would practice jumping in the life raft if we um, suffered a capsize. Lots of things like that, preparing for the inevitable if it were ever to happen. What's it like on the boat? What do, you, what do they tell you to bring on board with you? So you need to pack as light as possible, and that will involve something kind of dry that you might wear on the inside of the, of the boat. But then on top of that, you need to wear your, your fowlies, they call them, although some people call them oilies. I'm not particularly um, aware of the terminology in the US, but these are wet weather overalls that you wear to try and keep yourself dry but it's pretty impossible because there's spray and waves coming over the deck and you know you need to try and um, thrash the boat as fast as it can possibly go 
And that means that it's not particularly clean sailing. You just smash through the waves as fast as you can for 7,000 miles across the Pacific. Yeah, you just take a sort of a minimal amount of stuff. I was quite lucky in the sense that I was on there as a journalist. I also had to do all of the compulsory training and I had to be one of the crew. But at the same time, I took my laptop, I took a video camera, some GoPros, I took a a radio recorder, that sort of thing. So I actually had an extra probably 20 kilos worth of stuff just so that I could document the experience and, and tell the story at a later date. Did the race provide you with those overalls? Yeah, there was a set of overalls which were given to you. So the Clipper race has these um, red, their color scheme is red. But um, a lot of people bought their own um, dry suits, they're called. And these are much more professional suits which have much tighter bonds at the wrist and the neck and the ankles. Personally, I didn't have one of these things and it was probably one of the worst decisions I've ever made in my life because I was just constantly soaked throughout the whole experience. You're just damp. You know when you spend too long in the shower or a bath and your fingers and your toes and your the the, the soles of your feet get all wrinkly and horrible. It's a bit like being like that for a month. And when you throw into that salt water, which is actually incredibly corrosive when you have too much of it on your skin. I remember how bits of skin just started to peel away from my hands. It was quite a strange experience. And salt water is not a very nice thing to be around for a long period of time. And I remember how just constantly inhaling this quite stale salt water from the middle of the Pacific made my lungs feel almost like they were rusting from the inside. And I remember getting this really sort of chesty cough because I was just full of so much moisture. We have to, wherever possible, try and keep the inside of the yacht as dry as possible. So there would be this daily routine of not just taking out standing water, which was accumulating in the bottom of the boat, but also drying off, toweling off. Con- condensation and moisture from the inside created by human bodies but also just created by spray getting inside because that just causes everything to get damp and moldy it makes food go sour it makes the human body turn a bit strange and yeah it's just not very good for you and just like i said before the pacific is just a disgusting place anyone who chooses to go out there probably needs quite significant psychiatric help because it is just such a grotesque place. How many people were on your crew? So these yachts are identical and they are 70 foot long. And um, they can, I think, take up to 16 people. So the crews are somewhere between 10 and 16 that changes depending on which teams um, have particular people getting involved, particular legs, and some people are doing round the world and things like that. But I think on average, probably about a dozen different people. But the inside of the yacht is no palace in any stretch of the imagination. It is a, a stripped down, uncomfortable place. If they can save weight, then they do. And I remember at some time, I mean, we're racing on a 24 hour watch cycle. So we would have um, watch systems of four hours. So it was four hours on, four hours off, four hours on, four hours off for an entire 28 days to cross the Pacific. So there wasn't enough bunk beds for everyone to be in bed at the same time because, well, you're you're racing the boat in one direction as fast as you can go. So basically, You would jump out of your bunk, put on your wet weather gear as someone was jumping into the bunk. It was horrendous, really. To be honest, I managed to get away with, um, I kind of pushed my luck a little bit because I was working as a journalist. So I managed to be slightly outside of of the watch cycle because I was documenting the whole thing. But um, yeah, the lifestyle is takes a lot of getting used to and if i'm honest i struggled with it it just it just really isn't the sort of place 
um, which I find fun. It's a, a real tough thing. Well, you had a lot of seasickness, as you mentioned, but when you were able to eat, what were you, what do they cook? You know, what are, do you cook your own food is, or does, is there a group cook or, or group uh, experience or how does that work with the food? The crew would be divided into two watch cycles. So generally speaking, let's say of a dozen people or let's say 14 people, there would be two watch cycles of six people. And then outside of those watch cycles, there would be the skipper who jumps in and out of the watch cycles when he sees fit. If I don't know, we're heading towards a particularly nasty storm or if something needs sorting out, he'll just rotate between the two and sleep when he needs to, and blah, blah, blah. But then outside of that, there'll also be someone called the mother. And every 24 hours, the mother would change. And it would be the mother's responsibility to cook all the meals, to bake some cake, perhaps bake some biscuits and some cookies and and just make sure that everyone is well fed. So making cups of tea and coffee, making sure everyone's well hydrated, filling up water bottles, that sort of thing. So foods would involve things like porridge, rice, pasta, really, really quick and easy carbohydrate meals that people could just throw down as quickly as possible and then get back to to work and most of these things didn't really have much flavor we used to just cover stuff in salt and sugar and syrup and just try and make it as as flavorsome as possible and like you said i did have really really bad seasickness on that journey and i remember we had um We had this specific brand of sweet chili sauce and this sweet chili sauce. And we had sweet chili sauce and we had sriracha sauce. And this was the only thing we really had to make our food even remotely flavorsome. So we used to have a big bowl of pasta or rice and then we used to cover it in sriracha. But at the same time, I was really, really unwell with seasickness. So I used to eat this big bowl of pasta cover it in chili sauce because it was the only palatable way of getting it into my stomach. And then about half an hour later, I would be throwing this food up over the side of the yacht. So since then, I've been absolutely scarred by that taste. I can no longer eat sriracha sauce or sweet chili sauce because it reminds me of a month in the middle of the Pacific throwing up about half a dozen times a day. I will forever be scarred by that experience. (laughs) <laughs> well, you never know. Maybe 20 years from now, you'll be able to to try it again. <laughs> I hope so, maybe. So did you ever play the role of the mother? Yes, I would say that I probably did that more than most people because, like I say, I was there as a journalist, so it was easier for me to jump between the watch cycles and work outside of that rotation. And if I'm honest, I was very, very sick for the first few days. I wasn't well, when the really bad weather hit. I remember we rounded the, the southern point of Japan, and for about three or four days, I was um, so sick I, I couldn't really contribute to the sailing of the boat, which was very, very embarrassing at the time. But I, I'll be the first person to admit to that that frailty. I was just totally out of my comfort zone, and the problem is, is that seasickness isn't just throwing up that's one small part of it seasickness becomes such an acute problem that it is extreme nausea and dizziness and the problem is is you can't actually really contribute to much you become an absolute liability to yourself and the people around you so actually in a lot of cases it's sometimes safer for you to be in your bunk away from other people because if you're in the swirling pacific and you're feeling nauseous and you're you're not really thinking straight and perhaps you don't properly clip your life harness on to the right part of the boat just because you're seasickness you could easily be washed overboard so i had to spend three or four days just hiding from the rest of the team because i was a, a complete liability to be around You've talked about 
it's a pretty dangerous place to be. It just wants to eat you up. Someone did actually die during this uh, on another crew. W- when the crew that you were with found out about this, when you guys found out, what was the reaction like? Yeah, that was one of the, the strangest days of my life, I think. We had just got to about halfway point in the Pacific. We were about three and a half thousand miles from dry land in any direction. And we encountered one of the biggest Pacific storms for at least the last couple of decades, I think. We ended up getting hit by a storm which was a thousand miles from one side to the other. We got capsized, well, we sort of got broached onto one side. We almost totally capsized. We almost died out there. It was it was really, really serious. We managed to survive through the night and we'd almost broken some sails. We'd almost snapped our beam. It was just really, really full on. And we, we felt incredibly lucky to have survived that. But in a race, we were in a fleet of 12 yachts. So at any one point, the, the fleet is probably separated by sometimes up to a thousand miles. So you might have a yacht 100 miles ahead of you. You might have a couple of people 50 miles to one side and then the, the, the real stragglers at the back, maybe eight or 900 miles behind you. So we survived this very, very extreme storm. But then about 12 hours later, I remember the skipper got a call on the, um, the radio to say that there'd been a fatality in one of the yachts that was just behind us. The problem was, is that in this storm, um, one of the other sailors had been washed overboard. And I think it took, I think, over an hour for, for the yacht to locate her, um, by which point she'd, um, she'd sadly died. And um, the strange thing about being involved in a race like that is that although the different crews are on their own yachts and their own, they're sailing as a team, there is quite a team and community dynamic across the fleet. So I remember that some of the people I was sailing with knew this person well. They were close friends. And the skipper on our yacht had to break it to the the crew that that someone had died. And, um, yeah, it was a strange, somber, incredibly sad experience something I'll never, never forget. And it really just does put into perspective just how potentially dangerous that sort of place is. You managed to survive. You make it into Seattle. That leg of the journey is over. Now you begin the cycling leg across the United States. Is your bike there ready to go? How do you, I mean, how do you get that part of your kit ready? I shipped my bike to Seattle from the UK. So that was traveling to Seattle while I was um, sailing across the Pacific. There had been thought about potentially taking it on one of the yachts. However, with my added weight and then with all of all of my extra kit, the crew wasn't particularly keen about taking an extra bike as well because it's quite a big cumbersome thing to put in the, the hull of the boat. So um, I shipped it to Seattle and um, picked it up and put it all back together when I arrived in, in Seattle. And you, part of it was that you were towing a trailer. Why did you decide to go with a trailer? You know what? I have absolutely no idea. I think it was a bit of naivety on my part. I'd never done a big self-supported bike ride before. I came up with this crazy idea to sail and cycle halfway around the world. But by that point, I'd never cycled anything more than a thousand miles in one go and i'd done that in a group and it was supported so i had absolutely no idea what i was doing really i had all of this kit that i needed to take with me and i ended up buying this um this bob yak trailer on ebay i think it was about 30 pounds so i flew with that out there with me and um yeah i put a bag and stuff on the back i guess the reality sometimes of doing these things as a journalist is that I need to take some essential items. I need my laptop. I need my microphones. I need my cameras. I need a host of batteries and charging cables. Before I've even set off, I've probably got about 20 kilograms of stuff that a more normal cycle tourist or person wouldn't have. So that's always a bit of a problem for me. So I decided to go with the trailer. 
I actually love pulling a trailer. It's, it's really cool. And I think you feel a little bit more balanced at times than just having panniers on the front and the back of the bike. I had this fishing rod that I'd attached to the back of the bike, to the back of the trailer. And I had this flag off of the back. And I remember the first woman that I stayed with uh, just outside Seattle, she had some Nepalese prayer flags and she gave me these prayer flags and she said, these will keep you safe on your journey. So I strung these prayer flags from the top of this um, fishing rod all the way down to the back of my seat. And what you become is people can see you from a very long distance, which is great on all of the big, long, straight roads in the middle of the U.S., huge trucks can see you from a distance so i don't really care how stupid i look i just want to be spotted because if i'm sharing the road with vehicles i want to try and be as safe as possible at the same time making yourself as colorful and as interesting as possible becomes a conversation starter with thousands of people so I remember when I was cycling across the US, it was basically impossible for me to go to a gas station and buy Coca-Cola or a bottle of water or cookies or whatever, and not end up engaged, engaged in a, a massive conversation with someone about what I was doing, because you don't just look like a guy out on a bike ride. You look like a guy who's doing something big and doing something interesting. So actually, I, I quite like that. I'm a bit of a show off. I like. Um, making a big thing out of it and then people approaching me and asking me what on earth i'm up to <laughs> yeah you know the the trailers do actually work quite well the only pain really is when you have to turn around direction yeah and also the problem is if you're putting that much weight on your back spokes and through your back rim and uh, through your back tire i had quite a lot of problems with my back tire and that involves having to obviously turn the bike upside down and um you know get everything off and it can become quite laborious if you're having punches every couple of days you've got to take off the um the trailer you've got to disconnect that and then just i i got through about i think three or four back tires just on that journey just because so much pressure was going through that back wheel I had so many um, broken spokes as well. In the end, I was just carrying a big handful of spokes just to try and get from one side of America to the other. You had $1,000 to get you across. Was that adequate? No, not at all. Um, it was totally inadequate. I worked out that with this $1,000 that I had, it was probably just enough money to pay for the food I'd need. It allowed me to buy a couple of cups of coffee a day and then at the end of the day, maybe buy a couple of cold beers just to try and relax. But I had absolutely no money whatsoever budgeted for accommodation. So this was a bit of a blessing and a curse, really, because it meant that I couldn't just stop in a motel or even pay to go to an RV park. But at the same time, it really makes you realize that there are lots of people out there who are eager to be part of your journey in a sort of a, a little way so when i was cycling across america i got really into couch surfing and warm showers which are both brilliant pre-pandemic ways of meeting people and i really hope that we go back to that as quickly as possible because it's it's a fantastic way of connecting with like-minded people so um i used to just go and pitch my tent in people's backyards when they invited me or I put my tent up in quite a few um, national parks and just did a bit of wild camping. I think only once did I spend, I think, $50 on a motel because I can't remember what happened, but I think my bike was broken and I was horrendously sunburned or something. And I just thought to myself, it's 50 bucks. I've got to splash out. I've got to do this. I have to have a cold shower. Um, but yeah, most of the time I just wild camped in the middle of nowhere or got invited into people's homes. It was an amazing experience. Uh, who was the most interesting person that you met? Wow. I stayed with such an incredible breadth of people. I stayed with rich people, poor people, old people, young people. I think I stayed with two or three um, veterans from the Vietnam War. 
I stayed on the porch of a, a Lutheran pastor. I stayed in the pool house of um, some tech millionaires. They were awesome people. I stayed with some particularly religious people, which for someone who comes from somewhere like Britain, for me, that's quite strange. There are pockets of quite extreme Christianity in America, which is fascinating, but it's quite different in contrast to Britain because we don't really have that sort of thing. So that was very interesting. I stayed with some some very interesting Christians. I stayed with farmers. I stayed with this one guy on this ranch in Montana. I'd broken my bike on this long straight road in the middle of Montana. He stopped and uh, he said, "You can come back to my place. I've got um I've got a workshop. We can fix your bike." So I threw my bike onto the back of his um, pickup and he drove down this road maybe a mile and a half or something and his house the area around his house was probably the small size the, the size of a small county in in british terms he was surrounded by cattle and horses just his workshop outside his house was the size of someone's normal house it was incredible and he he cracked open a few cold beers he had some employees come over. He was, um, I can't remember what it did. I think he was a carpenter. He fixed my bike. He gave me a warm, warm place to stay for the night. And then um, we said our goodbyes the next day. It was an amazing experience. And just, you know, traveling in that, that fashion, you realize that the world is just full of incredible people. And most people just want to share a little bit with other interesting people and i can't wait until we just get back to that uh, the last year has just been such a shock to the system for me and i think for all of us we're all desperate for human contact again was that your favorite part of the the cycling leg meeting the people yeah i love not knowing what's going to happen next it's really really addictive you know that's why i try and turn these journeys into something a bit more mainstream now that i can share these experiences with people around the world through television or radio or through newspapers because i think there is an interest in that there is a an appetite and an interest in the kindness of strangers i also love just being out on the open road i love the idea of just sitting in the in the saddle and just sitting on some of those long straight roads in Montana or the Dakotas. Sometimes when I had the wind behind me in North and South Dakota, I could travel at 20 miles per hour. And that was going quite gently. Once you have the wind behind you, you've got the prevailing wind behind you in the Dakotas. You can cruise on those long flat roads easily at 20 miles per hour. When the wind turns against you, it's absolutely hellish because it's almost like trying to cycle through through soup it, yeah i remember sometimes i was like creeping along at five or six miles per hour it was horrendous but uh you know i say to people a lot when they ask me about my greatest adventures around the world i think about it and i think to myself those two months which i spent cycling from one side of america to the other i think if i could do that over and over again. I think that would be my real happy place. That trip just came at a point in my life when I was just, I was eager to prove what I was capable of to myself and maybe a few people around me that actually these, these crazy big adventures are really doable. If you just break them down into, into small chunks, if you just say to yourself, today I'm going to sit on my bike and I'm going to cycle 100 miles. If you do that week after week, all of a sudden you've sailed and cycled halfway around the world. That's quite an incredible achievement. I want to talk a bit about the craft of uh, piecing together this, um, this audio documentary that you did. Are you just capturing everything with a tape, rec tape recorder in the, I guess it's not a tape recorder, but a digital recorder uh, as you go along? Yeah, so I've got a, um, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but it's, a, it's like a, a recording device with a uh, with an xlr lead which goes to an industry standard microphone and this thing probably weighs i don't know maybe a kilo altogether and um, this allows me to do broadcasts all around the world i can connect it to the wi-fi i can record onto an sd card and then i can upload those files onto my computer and then um, 
cut all that together as a kind of soundscape, I guess. And yeah, that documentary is a collection of sound effects which I recorded on location. So that's uh, me walking into grocery stores and talking to people because you want to try and create, you know, what we call in the, the journalism industry, color. We want a sort of a sense of place and you want to be transported to the sort of environment. And then what I will then do is at the end of that, I will record a a voiceover and then I will then intertwine that to create some sort of narrative. And then I will also record individual interviews with interesting people I meet along the way who can give me an insight into you know where they live, who they are, and a particular element of the story which I'm trying to capture. And yeah, like you say, that, that went out on the BBC World Service. That was a really cool project. I don't do so much radio at the moment, but I love the skills of trying to create a sense of place with sound. And um, I'm very eager to do more projects like that in the future. Yeah, I love those types of um, content. Just just love it. That's kind of what led me down the eventually the road into podcasting was the very first time I heard the show This American Life on the radio like 20 years ago. I was like, oh my gosh, that's so good. How do, how, do you, how do you do stuff like that? That's just what I wanted to learn. I love radio. And actually, radio has, has really stood the test of time over the years. I think um, radio statistically is more popular now than it ever has been. So it is timeless. Again, I often think about and get asked about what discipline do I enjoy the most because I do print, online, radio, television now. And I would have to say probably my my heart lies with radio because I think it is the most challenging but also the most interesting journalistic form. I think if you can create a solid story with sounds and with with a good tight script, those storytelling elements can then be transmitted into something like television where you have this whole other uh, medium available to you in which people can actually see what you're doing and where you are. But if you can learn those initial skills in something like radio, it really puts you in good stead for then storytelling in the future. So on this audio documentary that you created, what do you deliver? Are you then dropping your individual pieces that you recorded into some software and are you the one that's doing the editing yeah so i cut everything maybe 30 years ago 40 years ago that would have been different people would have gone out and done these things in a crew of three or four people but the problem is with journalism with anything these days everyone is trying to save money where possible i was just a one-man band i recorded everything I traveled all the distances, and then at the end, I ended up with, I don't know, a hard drive filled with audio grabs. And then um, I sat down and I spent a couple of weeks just creating the documentary from scratch, really. And that's just a case of building an undercurrent of sound and then throwing in little bits of um, sound effect, which some of, some of those I'd record on location. Some of those I would record... Um, afterwards as well and then just sort of intertwine them in to just try and create a nicer sense of place and then more of my script and you just want to try and build a kind of a from the foundations up a story basically it's all it all just boils down to storytelling and what software did you use i used the most simple software to use i just use audacity i've tried lots of different types of editing software i think they are complicated for absolutely no need, essentially, for all I'm doing. You know, I'm not creating a, a record. I'm not trying to create a number one album. Everything I need is just a couple of timelines, some volume controls, and then maybe just smooth off the edges to make everything just kind of flow and, and look a bit nice in waveform. And then, um, then it should sound good. So I, I, if anyone out there wants to try and make their own audio documentaries, Keep it very, very simple, because actually the essentials and the fundamentals of creating audio documentaries are incredibly simple. Don't try and overcomplicate things. Did you have any official training or are you entirely self-taught? Entirely self-taught. I've never really had any official training in any element of journalism, actually. I've just taught myself everything on the job. Again, if there are people listening to this who are eager to one day become journalist 
I would encourage them to just try and learn as many different skills as possible because that has allowed me to make a living as a journalist because I work across different mediums. I can work two or three different video editing softwares, not particularly well, but I, I, can, I can do basic things. I can use Audacity or um, Adobe, Photoshop, things like that. And these are just small things that you need to tell interesting stories. The days are over where a writer can get paid a decent salary just to go out produce 2,000 words and take a, a, a paycheck. It just doesn't work like that anymore. You have to be able to you know, tell stories in different forms. Now, if you are doing this sort of a piece as a freelancer, are you able to share? Like, wow, What kind of money can you get from doing a piece like this? The BBC thing? Yes. Ah, uh, Well, I probably made a few thousand pounds from that trip in total. I think I worked out when I added it all up all of the time I put into that journey before and after, I think I worked out that I was probably earning about $20 a day. So you don't do these things to make lots and lots of money. You do it because you want it to lead on to the next thing and the next thing. And like any career, you just gradually climb up the ladder and you gradually earn more money, basically. But I remember that that project was a labor of love. I wanted to sail and cycle around the world i didn't have to pay for it i mean if, if the whole trip if i would have paid for the whole trip it might have cost me 30 or forty thousand dollars. but actually i managed to make money from it so where i was at in my life and where i was at in terms of my journalism and and i wanted to prove to people what i was capable of and i wanted it to be a springboard to the next thing which is i guess the way i think about everything in my career i want it to be the next opportunity it just seemed like the right thing to do but yeah if you ever break those things down into well what could i be doing instead it, it's not cost effective but it depends do you want to get paid to sail and cycle around the world or do you want to go and sit behind a desk somewhere for 200 dollars a day it's, you know it's, it's up to you how you want to live your life well said um and the next thing Let's, uh, it's a good segue into Earth Cycle, which I think is your latest project. How did th uh, the idea for this come about? Yeah, so when I was cycling across the US, I remember cycling into the, um, the state of Ohio. As I entered Ohio, there were these cicadas which were hatching from the ground. Every 17 years, this specific species of cicada hatches from the ground and there was absolutely millions of these things swarming around around me as i was cycling through i started to think to myself this is an incredible privilege to actually be here right now as this animal is emerging from the ground and as i cycled on for the next 10 100 miles i started to dream up this idea about the natural cycles of planet earth and how it is an incredible experience to see these things at the gentle speed of a bicycle. So by the time I'd reached New York, I dreamt up this idea for Earth Cycle. And the, the concept and the premise of Earth Cycle is to cycle massive distances around the planet, maybe 1,000 or 2,000 miles in one go, while attempting to chart the seasonal cycles of planet Earth. So it's an opportunity for me as a journalist to go on these big, grueling adventures. But at the same time, uncover interesting things so in the first series we shot it in scandinavia on a 2000 mile bike ride through norway and sweden and i was investigating things like endangered bee species or particular types of invasive species in the um in the arctic ocean i was um, foraging for seasonal mushrooms with local experts that's the sort of thing i think there's an emerging trend for that sort of programming and Hopefully, Earth Cycle is going to be at the, um, the crest of that wave when we can get out and make more programs. Were you more than just a one-man band this time? So, yeah, for that trip, although it was just me on my bicycle, I was followed by um, a cameraman in a car because there's only so much one person can do. You need, if you want to make TV especially and actually look any good, you need to collaborate with um, a production company. So I spoke to um, a chap called Cliff Webb, who I was actually filming for 
crossing across the Pacific and the Atlantic. And I said to him, do you want to collaborate on this program? And then over time, we, we developed this program together. So Cliff and 1080 Media provided a, um, a cameraman who came and followed me. And then um, all of that footage went back to a team of editors who then turned that into um, a five-part series. Are they providing the financing uh, ahead of time? Um, so you're sort of getting paid before it airs? No. So again, myself and the production company made took a punt on the idea. We self-funded that. And then we have now sold it in about 20 countries around the world and have made back all of our money, which is great. Uh, because once again, we believed in the idea. You just get a nose for an idea. You get a nose for a story over time working in this industry. And if you have enough conviction that something's good, I don't think you should expect other people to necessarily take a risk on it if you're not prepared to take a risk on it. We knew that Earth Cycle was a good idea. Over several months and a year, we developed the idea and we, we believed in it as a concept. So we put a little bit of our own money into it and we went out and filmed it. So far, it's, um, it's proved to be a, a good investment of our time, I think, because we recently won an award in the UK. And hopefully, just by speaking to people like yourself and spreading the word about about the project, we can go out and make more series because that's what I want to do. I want to share these adventures with audiences around the planet. Where do people go to view it? So it's on Amazon Prime, if that's available to people in the US. I know we have rights in, I think, Europe and the UK. I'll check. All you have to do is just search for Earth Cycle on your Amazon Prime subscription. And I believe there may have been a couple of cable channels in the US. The best thing to do will be to follow me on social media at Simon W. I. Parker. And then whenever I get told that the series is going to be aired on a particular channel around the world, I will tweet that out or put it on my Instagram and just let people know so they can watch the series. What was your most fun part of creating the series? The thing about television is it's a really, really long process. So I think from the moment we had the idea to now, that was about four years, and we won our first award for the series last year. So actually, if I'm honest with myself, I don't really like the really long-winded nature of television. I'm, I'm very restless. I want things to be done immediately, and I have to, have to remember sometimes that with something like TV, that doesn't just happen. So that was probably the, sort of the thing I struggled with the most. For me, it's just being on the road. It just feels like such a privilege to be out on my bicycle talking to people and telling their stories and seeing interesting things. I'm not a journalist because I'm going to be a millionaire. I do it because I get to do interesting things. I go on adventures and, and uncover stories which just money cannot buy. And the best thing about being a journalist is you get to just meet people who are willing to, I guess, just open themselves up to you in a way that perhaps they wouldn't to another complete stranger. I'll never get bored of that, I don't think. So just being on those long roads in Arctic Sweden and seeing a moose cross the road or seeing snow falling on the mountains, these things are just priceless experiences. Simon, where are your interests going to take you next? Well, good question. I mean, I'm always looking for new and interesting journeys which can allow me to uncover something interesting about the world. So before Christmas, I set off on a big project for the Telegraph newspaper in the UK. It was a six part article series and uh, several short films. And I cycled the length of Britain. I cycled all the way from the very northernmost point of Shetland all the way down to the um, southernmost point of England. And this was a 1,300-mile um, bike ride. I've just decided that I'm going to go and do it all again in spring. So I'm going to cycle all the way back up to the top of Britain. And the whole idea is to try and document pandemic Britain. We've had a particularly bad time of it in the UK. We've had over 100,000 deaths. It's been a pretty bad year in terms of lockdowns. I'm very intrigued by going on big overland journeys, but at the same time trying to find out about what's happening in a particular place and why that's interesting. So in the immediate future, I'm going to go off on another big uh, cycling adventure around Britain because the borders are closed, so I can't really go many other places. 
And then soon I'd really like to start branching out into books. I like the idea of long form projects. I started off in journalism and basically we were just turning around columns and uh, videos and radio broadcasts on a daily basis. But I actually quite like the idea of being invested in a project which goes on for for many weeks and months. That, that is quite nice to work on long form programming. In terms of the books, are you thinking of self-publishing? Probably not, if I'm totally honest. I kind of if I'm if I'm totally honest, I'm I'm quite a traditionalist when it comes to the world of journalism and publishing. I I would worry that if I'm self-publishing a book, it doesn't really have much commercial value. I know there will be a lot of people that disagree with that, but I'm now working on a, a proposal for a book which I'm about to start pitching out to publishers. And I've just been brought up i guess and indoctrinated with the idea that if your idea is good enough it will have commercial value and it will get picked up by editors and commissioners so maybe but i don't really want to spend a year writing a book and then self-publishing it and then at the end of that no one wanting to read it that would just be a complete waste of a year of my life so um at the moment no but you never know in the future how can people contact you if they want to learn more so the best thing is to probably follow me on social media. So on Twitter and Instagram, my handle is at Simon W. I. Parker. Uh, you mentioned my website at the beginning, Simon W. Parker dot co dot UK. There's um, there's a contact form on that. If people want to drop me a line about any collaborations or questions about anything I've discussed. Yeah, the best thing to do is probably follow me on social media and just interact that way. OK, Simon Parker. Thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate it. It's been great talking to you. I love hearing about these adventures and best of luck on your next cycling adventure in the UK. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks again for listening. This episode was recorded on February 5th, 2021. If you want to write to me, my email address is paul at the com. You can also leave me a voice message by either recording a message with your phone and emailing it or by using SpeakPipe. You can do that by going to speakpipe.com slash the pursuit zone. The best way to support the podcast is to subscribe and tell all your friends and family about it. Be sure to follow the pursuit zone anywhere you get your audio content. To find out more information about this episode and others, head on over to the pursuit zone.com. 